My name's Jamie O'Donoghue, and for the last 10 years, I've had my own education recruitment business. And uh, in the last year, I've recently opened my own gym and transitioned into the online slash in-person fitness coaching world. Now, the purpose of um, my interview today is in September 2022, I had a pretty big wake-up call and a massive sort of health scare and was diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. And on my journey to normal sinus rhythm, I discovered a consultant cardiologist and a heart health specialist online who was putting out some amazingly sort of educational content. And it's with great pleasure for me to be sat here with him today and introduce um, him. So please, without further ado. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Um, I know you've come all the way to Hull. Yeah. So it's really, <laughs> it's really nice of you. Gosh, so, um, so it's very interesting. Um, you know, tell, tell me a little bit about your AF. What, what happened? You, you were getting on with your life. Everything was okay. And then what happened? How did it all happen? So it was a, it was a Saturday evening and I was playing with my son and he was sort of stressing me out a little bit. And I just remember sitting down and just having this, like, this feeling of just like my heart rate just increased massively and it was just beating all over the place and it was jumping around and I was feeling anxious and I didn't really know what was going on and I said to my partner you know what's feel this and she started to get a bit worried and just like being a typical man I was like you know it's fine I'll sleep it off so went to bed um, woke up in the morning and was due to go and play football um, felt fine, I felt a bit tired, but the heart rate wasn't going too fast. And along the way, I stopped, got a coffee. As soon as I had a sip of the coffee, it was like it just started going off again. Um, I got to the football ground and I was kind of just sitting there sort of feeling this like intense, um, yeah, my heart rate was just going really fast and erratic. Um, I ended up playing the football match and throughout the game, I got to the point after about an hour where I was just like my breathing started to sort of jump a little mm. bit and it was you know I knew something was wrong and I was just trying to like fight against it mm -hmm. um, and what happened was I came off the pitch and Whittington Hospital was like a 10 minute walk away so I decided to walk up to the hospital I walked in and the hospital was completely rammed so I walked out and it was almost like problem. oh you know but I decided to go back straight away and somehow ended up going straight through. Um, they, they, they did some tests on me. They, they, took, yeah, they took me straight through and um, they put me on a drip. They did an ECG and there was definitely, you could tell they were concerned. How fast something. were you going? Um, I think it was like 190, 180. Gosh, 180, 190. Yeah, and it was, it, was, it was jumping up and down. But I didn't really understand any of this. I, no. I was just going off of what was happening around me. There was doctors, there was people trying to, you know, it was just a lot to process. And it kept me in for, for that whole evening. And they came to me and said, look, we're not going to send you home because we found uh, an enzyme in your blood that we need to in investigate. Uh, so I didn't understand what that was either. Yeah. So I um, was calmed down at that stage. My heart was in an irregular rhythm, I'd noticed. And it was only until the morning the doctor came into me and said th that I'd had a heart attack. Now, obviously, at the time, I'm like my whole, everything is just completely, oh my God, yeah. what the hell was going on? Like, how have I ended up in this situation? You know, what... What, have I what done has wrong? happened? You know, what, what do you mean? It's like, when did I have a heart attack? I, I, I need to kind of understand what was going on. But at that stage, they had to treat me as though I'd had a heart attack. They said that um, I presented with um, potential damage to the structure of the heart. Um, the, my ejection fraction was low. And they were trying to investigate why the AF, why the irregular rhythm was there. Mm -hmm. and, and I understand, I get it. Um, I understand why they were doing that. So they put me up onto um, the cardiac unit and I was there for about a week waiting to go and get tests and they were monitoring. I was still in AF the whole time. And fortunately, uh, they sent me to Bart's for an angiogram. Right. 
and they, that came back clear. So that that excludes a, a heart attack. That that's, that's yeah, yeah. That tells you you haven't had a heart attack. Yeah. So so at, at the time they didn't say to me. Oh, actually, they did. They, 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 at that point, I just remember it being a lot of the the scare just went away. W- went away. Yeah. So the concern wasn't there as much. But they, I still had the AF, so they were talking to me about how I treat, so, so, sort of making me understand the medication, um, anticoagulants, um, bisoprolol, and just talking to me about what was going to happen next, really, from there. And it was, I was probably out of hospital for about two months before I had a cardio version and an MRI, um, which caused, I mean, when I had AF the whole time, I kind of learned to manage it. So for two months, I was really getting used to just slowing down. You know, I've, I I do genuinely believe, and maybe, you know, we'll talk about this more, but I put it down to my stress and lifestyle, which was what put me into mm. AF. So throughout that period of two months, I thought, right, if I just stress less and sort my lifestyle out, then I can, you know, I'm going to make myself better. And I kind of learned to live with the AF and until I had the cardio version. And the cardio version put me back into sinus rhythm, but ultimately what it did was it then turned it into paroxysmal AF. Yeah. And that just made me, every time I was going in and out of AF, it was making me relive that first moment of when I first had AF and was told I'd had a heart attack. So I'm overthinking everything and... and then spending months in and out of AF and kind of getting used to deal with things in a different way. And at that stage, I said to um, the electrophysiologist, I said, right, let's let's do the ablation and get it done. So, so yeah. And so you had the ablation and that's been a success? Yeah, it's been a success. Uh, mm-hmm. I had it in September 2023. Uh, an amazing team. Like I, I must say that I, from the start to finish, from the Whittington Hospital up and up to the Barts and Nuffield, the way I was taken care of was was amazing. Um, the ablation was was it was an it was an experience, you know. It's being put to sleep, having people working on your heart, and it, it, it's it's quite scary, you know. But now that it's done, I kind of look back and I'm, I'm really grateful that the procedure exists, you know. Yeah, and presumably you realise now that. Even though it may, the thought of it may have seemed scary. It was probably not as bad as you th- thought it was going to be. Right? Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. I mean, in the build up to it, when yeah. when I'm having to think, okay, what's actually going on here? Yeah. You know, the ha- the whole procedure itself is a, is is amazing. Um, you know, if you wouldn't mind, kind of giving us giving me some details of how, what an ablation actually yeah, is would we'll be really good certainly yeah. talk about that as well i mean um yeah of course i can i can tell you everything about af i mean you're as equipped to tell me about <laughs> af having had it yourself you know i just yeah. tell people about it whereas you've actually lived it so in some ways yeah this is a two-way yeah educational <laughs> talk um uh, but yeah, I'll, I can I can tell you everything that I know about AF, yeah, uh, and hopefully for your viewer, it'll be quite nice to get a doctor's insight as well yeah, as the, absolutely. the person yeah. who's lived it. But far, why don't you ask me all the questions you want me to try and answer, and we can talk about yeah. them. And uh, yeah, so um, one of the things along my throughout my journey with AF was um, I found it difficult to find other people that were my age uh, who had the same experience mm-hmm. as me. So I felt like it was, very, uh, it was very difficult for me to get other mm-hmm. information from people. So I suppose one of the main key questions I have is, you know, what are the common causes of AFib in the young mm-hmm. and the risk factors? Yeah, of course. So the first thing is, I've thought long and hard about this. And I thought, okay, why do bad things happen to anyone? You know, what are the things? And I've sort of kind of broken it down into four things. Okay, there's age, but you can't control your age. Uh, There's genetics. Unfortunately, you can't control your genetics. Uh, There is plain old bad luck. And then there is lifestyle as well. Now, what we've discovered is that a lot of AF that we see tends to occur in the older population. 
And in those people, largely what we see is it's a manifestation of getting older and perhaps bad lifestyle. Mm. What we are beginning to become very cognizant of now is that we do see it increasingly in young people, exactly like yourself. And I would say about 10% of all the AF we see, we see in younger people. Now, in the younger people, I'm not sure whether you can necessarily always blame lifestyle, and you certainly can't blame age because they are generally young. And the people that we see it in tend to be really healthy people. They tend to be runners. They tend to be really, really healthy people. Uh, so as people have been interested in the, you know, in this condition, the question really is, well, why? And what we're beginning to realize is that many of these people have other family members who've had AF as well. And therefore, there may well be a genetic link. And of course, we know a little bit about genetics, but we don't know everything. And increasingly, people think that there may be these polymorphisms where you may have a vulnerability on one, one gene and another vulnerability. And Perhaps on its own, it's not enough to show up the AF, but if you have a combination of these yeah. and then you have some kind of trigger, then that vulnerability comes out. It's a little bit like someone rubbing a lamp mm. and the genie escapes, right? Mm. And then the problem is once the genie has escaped, it becomes very difficult to get away. the genie back in. And if you do, he's more likely to escape the next time. So this is exactly what happened. You know, you, uh, you're getting on, you're a fit guy, you've not really lived long enough to lead a really bad lifestyle. Yeah. Uh, so I would, be, I would be inclined to think that maybe there's some kind of genetic predisposition and then the stress, et cetera, on that day, just this perfect storm happens and you go into AF of course, the stress, the sleepless nights, after all, that doesn't help. Yeah. And that then increases the propensity to AF. And we see this all the time. What is really interesting is that if you look at older, sicker people, mm. often they get AF and they don't even know about it. But you take the young, healthy people, when they get their AF, they feel absolutely awful. Yeah. That's very interesting. The other thing is, of course, AF is not just something that affects your quality of life, but it is also something that is purported to impact on length of life. Uh, and, the length, and the big thing that has been talked about is that AF in some people increases the risk of stroke substantially. But again, when you look, those people who are older and sicker, the they tend to factors. be much higher risk, yeah. even though they don't even know that they have yeah. the AF or they tolerate it quite well. Mm -hmm. Whereas the young, healthy people feel awful. Their quality of life yeah. is hugely impacted upon, yeah. but actually it doesn't really influence their yeah. length of life or increase the risk of stroke. So you, for example, are probably not taking anything mm. to prevent strokes now because yeah. you've had yeah. the ablation. No, exactly. Whereas had you been 80 and you were exactly in the same boat as you are now, yeah they would have recommended that you take an anticoagulant for life, yeah. even though your AF is no longer yeah. bothering you because the risk of strokes is high. So yeah, it was one of the big things actually, because I was looking at the medications that I was taking and I was trying to, I didn't want to not take any of the medication, but some of them, like the blood thinners, I was mm. looking at and thinking, okay, is, this, you know, is there a way for me to not have to take these? And once I started to understand some of your videos, which um, you, something you've just mentioned there about the anticoagulants, it, it just kind of enlightened me a little bit and gave me some really good knowledge about what I needed to do, basically. And in the build-up to the ablation, I had to take the blood thinners again. But yeah. it was, uh, And then for a couple of weeks after, I was able to come off them, which is really good, so... And the reason they give you those is because they're going to be manipulating your heart and they're going to be in the heart and they're going to be trying to get you out. So they cover that bit. Mm. But the reality is the need for anticoagulants is not really based on how much AF you're getting or how unwell you feel during the AF or how long your AF episodes last. Yeah. It's currently based on who you are. Are you young and healthy mm. or are you older do you have comorbidities such as diabetes, high blood pressure, heart failure, etc.? And that's one of the really important things. A lot of people don't understand that. They, say, they think, oh, when I go into AF, now I could have a stroke. Actually, 
as long as you're taking your anticoagulant, mm. it doesn't matter how yeah. uh, how many times you go into AF, etc. You're doing the best you can yeah. to minimize that, particularly if you're older and have comorbidities. Whereas in a young guy, in general, whether you have one episode once a year or five episodes every month, mm. the risk does not go up substantially. It is just the impact of it on your quality of life. And this is why the ablation is done. Yeah. Two, just allow you to get on without having to worry about going into AF, etc. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so just touching on, you mentioned about putting the genie back into the lamp. I really like that analogy. It's good. So in terms of, you know, the latest treatments and strategies for those, um, you know, what I, I had a cardio version that was the first thing. So do you mind just giving me some information on the role of a cardio version? Yeah, so the, the obviously the first thing to understand is that AF is a disorder both of rhythm and of rate. Okay, so the heart will go erratic and it can go very fast. And the symptoms are caused by both of those things. The symptoms can be caused by the heart just going fast meaning that you could leave it erratic, but if you slowed it down, the patient would feel better. Or in some people, even just the fact that it is erratic makes them very symptomatic. Because with any heart rhythm disturbance, the problem is less blood coming out. So some people tolerate the, the erratic bit very badly. Some people tolerate the erratic bit okay, but the speed is the issue. So the treatments are largely based around slow the heart down, but ideally, and ideally, if you can get them out of the erratic heartbeat, mm. then you've done both. You've gotten them out completely. You're not leaving them, you know. Yeah. So uh, in that sense, obviously, the questions are, well, how do you get that patient back into a normal rhythm? And what are the markers that may allow you to decide beforehand whether that attempt is going to be successful? Yeah. So obviously it can just happen on its own. You can, you know, if you leave it long enough, many people will just go back into a normal rhythm, but they have to bear the indignity of just feeling unwell during the time whilst they're waiting. Uh, there are medications. So there are some medications, uh, medi commonly used medications like beta blockers, another medication Flecanate, called flecanide, yeah, amiotron. These are medications that can be given when you go in and they'll, they'll give you that and that can help get the patient out. But then the question is, if those medications don't work, what else can you do? And one thing you can do is actually deliver a synchronized shock to the heart under general anesthetic, and that often works. And this is what a cardioversion is. A cardioversion is that you come in and they give you a synchronized shock under general anesthetic, and often that resets it. What are the markers that tell you that that is likely to be successful? Well, the, the first is, if you, are, if you have a structurally normal heart, if you're a young, fit guy, structurally normal, the AF has just come out of the blue, then that's one of a really good sign that that could work. The second thing is just looking at the size of the atrium. And if the atrium is, um, you know, is nice and compact, then uh, when you shock it, it's more likely to come back. If you take all comers, everyone with AF, and you try and shock them out, 50% uh, will go back into AF. So it doesn't last wow. very long mm. uh, and that and and again in your case what happened was you had a particularly bad episode of af yeah. they shocked you out but that propensity to af started manifesting it came back yeah like, it was just wanted to yeah. come back yeah. Yeah, i could feel it i was getting it uh, ectopic beats i would yeah because i i kind of had the shock and then you know i I, at that point, I'd really kind of taken care of my lifestyle and I was yeah. ready to go, you know. So I ended up do, falling back into the same thing of like fast pace with work and building up stress again and a little bit. But yeah. along the way, I could feel it was trying to come back. And then it started a whole new sort of era of the sort of recovery for me because then I had to adapt to being in and out of it and trying not to you know, you said about younger people, they tend to feel it a lot more and panic a lot more. So, so yeah. And with, with a cardioversion, they're not actually manipulating the heart. They're just doing this kind of system reset. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, whereas the next step after that is an ablation where you're actually doing something mm -hmm. to the heart. And uh, they, 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 what they've realized is that the 
the tissue where these AF signals, the irritable tissue is uh, the embryonic heart, or, you know, the heart which you, as an embryo you have, that actually becomes a sleeve around these four veins that feed into the atrium. Mm -hmm. And they think that those are the places where these signals come from. Yeah. So if you can actually isolate them, by delivering a burn or a freeze, freeze yeah. around that area, then the impulses are still generated, but they can't spread to the atrium to cause the atrial fibrillation. And that is the idea behind the ablation. But the incredible way, stuff. The way to think of an ablation is a little bit like trying to build a fence around a bunch of wayward horses. You know, yeah. you're trying to <laughs> coral these horses, and the horses are based in four different locations. Great. But even if one little one falls off, then the horses escape and the AF comes back. So there can be some natural healing, etc. And so a lot of times yeah. a patient may have an ablation. They say, oh, it's come back and they go it to is, the doctor. Yeah, it came back twice. <laughs> In the space of um, the first three months, it came back. Yeah. But it was only short episodes. So it's they'll about... call that the blanking period. They'll yeah. say, oh, first three months it's allowed. Yeah, and then, but beyond that, yeah. yeah. But if it comes back after that, you'll go to the cardiologist and say, oh, I think I just need to do a touch-up job, which is basically yeah. a little bit has healed or something. And these yeah. impulses have escaped, so they deliver another yeah. burn. That so what are the chances then of, you know, if you have an ablation, um, trying to remember what I was told, but what are the percentages of of how accurate they are and how they cure AFib? Well, so the, the, there's two or three things, I think. The, the first thing is that the only reason to have an ablation mm. is actually not because you think you're going to be cured. Mm. It's done to improve your quality of life. Yeah. yeah. Ultimately, you, if the AF still happens, but you don't know about it, that's okay. Mm -hmm. If it's not dangerous, yeah. you don't know about it and you're Absolutely. feeling better. Yeah. So that's what's happened in your case. You know, we don't know because we don't have a monitor on you all the time. Maybe you do get a little bit of AF that you know nothing about. We don't know. So rather than telling people that, oh, an ablation will cure your AF, I say an ablation will improve your quality of life provided it is the AF mm. that is impacting badly on your quality of life. Mm -hmm. That's really important. Uh, the second thing to say is the success rates largely depend on two things. Uh, one, patient selection. You want to get the right patients to do. So if you take uh, someone who is 75, they're very obese, they have diabetes, they drink a lot, you try and do an ablation on them. Mm the chances of that ablation being successful for very long are going to be low. It's going to be a technically more challenging thing. And in those people, the AF was a symptom rather than a condition. So yeah. you're essentially just treating the symptom. And unless they treat the underlying issues like the obesity, etc., the AF will yeah. come back. In someone like you, young guy, otherwise fit, doing everything else, it's great. You are the person who's going to have very high success, you know, 70, 80% success. Mm -hmm. It depends what success is. Is it improving quality of life? Is it getting rid of the air for good? No one quite really knows. But the chances of, the chances of you getting you to a place where you say, I'm happy now, are very high, you know, 70-80%. If The other thing is, it also depends on what the heart is like. So if you have AF, which is constantly present, then the chances of getting that uh, treated successfully with an ablation are very low. But if it comes and goes, they're much higher. Because when it comes and goes, it tells you your atria still have life in them. They're still capable of beating. Yeah. Whereas if it's constant you know, maybe the atria are dead. They're, they're, they're dead as in, you know, they're not working. And therefore trying to do anything to bring them back to life is going to be unsuccessful. So that's one thing. Uh, the fact that uh, if it's paroxysmal, an ablation is more likely to be successful. And many people now don't do it for persistent AF because the success rates are so poor. Mm. The second issue is uh, the size of the atrium. So if you look at the atrium and the atrium is very big, then the chances are that that atrium has been weakening over a period of time. Wow. So even if you try and manipulate it and get it to work again, it's going to give up. Mm. Whereas if the atrium is small and tight, that that that's more likely to be successful. So interestingly, young, healthy people, A, don't like their AF, B, don't seem to come to major harm from their AF, mm. and C, respond well to ablations. 
um, whereas the older population is the opposite. This perhaps also leads us into the question as to why do some people, why do young, healthy people feel their AF so much more than older, sicker people? And that's very interesting because what is happening is if you're young and healthy, your atria are nice and strong and everything is working well. So it's a fine machine. You know, the atria are doing their job. They're pushing the blood in. The heart is pumping the blood out. If you suddenly stop the atria working, boom, you know, everything goes crazy. In a sicker, older person, the atria has been under stress. So even though you're in sinus rhythm, the contribution that the atria is making is getting less and less and less over a period of time. It's a little bit like pulling an elastic band too much. So the contribution, the twang is less and less. So you're still in sinus rhythm, but the atria are not really doing very much. So the patient has already developed that period where their atria are not really doing much. And then when the atria goes and stops working altogether, the patient doesn't notice a huge difference because they'd already had weak atria before they went into atrial fibrillation. And that's probably the reason. So one of the biggest things for me uh, throughout my recovery was, wasn't just my trying to take care of my physical fitness, it was also my psychological health. So is there a link between physical and psychological fitness and how does it affect our cardiac health? Yeah, I think I think it's very important. I think your question is a very important one. I think that, you know, we've always sort of kept them separate, but really we're dealing with one body and therefore all of it connects with everything else. Uh, so you cannot be, I don't think, physically healthy if you're mentally unhealthy and vice versa. And the problem is that what we know is that if you are physically unhealthy, it has a mental, uh, it has an impact on your mental state. And if you become mentally healthy, then it affects your physical state. And therefore, a lot of people get into this very negative, vicious cycle. There have been studies which have actually looked at AF and the mental status of people. And they've identified that simple things like anger, seems to increase the amount of AF people get. Stress seems to increase the amount of AF people get. Depression seems to increase. Uh, uh, so this is well proven in research that if you take a diagnosed mental problem as one that has been diagnosed and a lot of it remains undiagnosed, it worsens all outcomes uh, that would have, uh, you know, compared to a person who doesn't have a dep associated depression with their AF. So a person with depression AF in general will have a worse quality of life and may potentially even have a worse long-term outcome compared to a person who doesn't have that. I'm sure. So, so it is very, very important that um, uh, from your side, because ultimately the question really for you is, what could I do for myself? What can these people who are watching me do for themselves how do I empower them? And your point is absolutely right. Uh, keeping your physical health going, but also addressing your mental health. And in that sense, there have been studies where they've shown things like yoga, for example. There was a study called Yoga My Heart Study, which actually showed that, you know, yoga reduced the amount of AF people were getting. Wow. So, it, it, I mean, yoga, it does it. You talk about improving quality of life, like yoga is something, breathing techniques. Have you heard of the Wim Hof method? Yes. Yeah, you know, so things like that could, again, really improve the way that you are psychologically. For me, one of the big, the reason why I asked this question, because I had a lot of anxiety, a lot of health anxiety. Uh, you know, you could, like you said before about when I could feel it, I could, I kind of was very hypersensitive to, to it and... Sometimes I found myself going back to the hospital, checking into A&E and almost like not really listening to what I was being told that I was okay, but then just worrying that have they missed something else? You know, what are they, do I need to speak to someone else? Do I need to go to a different hospital? Some, some places I would go and if they told me I'd feel absolutely fine and comfortable, but others not. And I, I did realise that, it was having um, a psychological impact, like an effect on me. Mm. I think that was the hardest part whilst I was in AF because from a fitness point of view, I, was, I wasn't overweight and I wasn't drinking or smoking. 
And it was just the, the psychological factor. But then I was also worrying about, is this good for me? You know, do, I need to snap out of this. Like it's, it's so, yeah, it was, it, it was quite, an, quite an interesting one. I mean, you've got to remember, it's a life-changing trauma, really. Mm. You know, you're, to be faced with your own mortality when you actually think you're, you know, invincible mm. is, is mm. a very traumatic experience. And, and a lot of people are left with a degree of PTSD. You know, it's a very real thing when you're diagnosed with something, particularly if it's a chronic condition. Uh, so, so what you've gone through is um, not dissimilar to what many young people go through, you know. And unfortunately, there's not that much help out there for them because people think, oh, you're young, you're healthy, we'll sort this out or it's not dangerous. And that's it. And actually, it is really important that uh, as medical practitioners, we become more familiar. That what, we, what we need to do is stop studying conditions. Uh, but instead, we should be studying patients with those conditions. That's the important thing. Because when you study a condition, you just say, okay, this is a condition. This is how you treat it. This is the... But what about the patient? The patient isn't a condition. The patient has a sense of identity. Their patient has aspirations. The patient has so many other things that factor in. They've got children, you know. And all those things, uh, you don't read about that in books. But it is only through vlogs like this that people will start saying, actually, this is... This is the bit that I was looking for, the bit where other people say, I went through trauma. Here's a young guy, you know, seemingly invincible, and he's brave enough to talk about how he felt mentally. And that there needs to be a, a lot more expression of that publicly. And certainly doctors like me need to be educated by people like you to say, well, this is what matters. You know, I don't want to feel lonely. I don't want to feel scared. I don't want to feel unsupported. I want someone who is kind enough not to look at me as a condition, but instead look at me as a person with, with this condition and the things that are affecting me. And so we should be really working towards providing more holistic care and also giving you tools which, you, you know, it shouldn't just be about tablets, take this, go away, or we'll do this ablation, et cetera, but actually saying, okay, well, if you do this, do this, this, at least you've got something where you feel empowered that you're going to, mm. you have some control because otherwise you're just completely out of control, you know. Mm. Uh, suddenly a chaotic heart rhythm has led to a chaotic life, uh, really. Um, but it doesn't have to be like that. Yeah. Well, I think education is is really important. And... You know, it's important for everyone, like you said, not just patients. You know, it's important for everyone to to really understand the risk factors and what we can do to to prevent, you know, things happening in future. Um, you know, I know at the moment there's, in terms of like, it's in a big thing of defibrillators mm -hmm. around, um, but, you know, defibrillators is almost like at, once something has happened, yeah. it's there, you know, so... I think it's so important that channels like yours exist and what you're doing because I am so sort of really grateful for the content that you you're putting out there and I really urge people to you know take one their health seriously but also their heart health as well and and the more people that are providing education for everyone is you know, Thank you. a great thing. I definitely think I definitely think you you're right in that what we've realized is that a lot of medicine now is about trying to fix you after you break. Mm. And there's not so much trying Finding to teach us course. about how do we stop breaking in the first place or even identifying those markers which tell us that we may break. You know, so everything happens after you go to hospital, all the research happens, this person comes in with AF, and so their studies are from there on, right? But what we want to be in a position to do is to be able to say, okay, A, what are the things uh, in my life which are perceived as being normal, but actually may be influencing my health badly? And are there any subtle markers that I can rely on now to tell me how it's going. You know, that, that I think is really important and not much work gets done on that, unfortunately, because we're all, a lot of our research is based around, you know, people wanting to sell something, sell a solution. <laughs> uh, and those that tend to be a little bit more profitable, so they attract the most research, etc. Yeah. So what, what has been your biggest take from educating the public about heart health on social media? 
I think the, uh, the, the, my biggest take is this, that the current level of education is very narrow. The problem is, who are these people who are educating you? They're people like me. But the problem is, what is my practice? My practice is following guidelines. So someone produces a bunch of guidelines. They say, a person with AF comes, you do this, 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 bang. Okay? And beyond that, I'm not even allowed to think because it'd be stepping outside the guidelines. So all my treatment, all the things I do, and a lot of my colleagues do, is very narrow visioned. You know, someone has given us a bunch of instructions and we follow it. And you can't risk being seen to think outside the box. And therefore, I think we do people a disservice because actually what we have to say is, is our treatment perfect? Do we cure everyone of this condition? And if we don't, then should we not be open to other suggestions? You know, should we not be collaborating with naturopaths and integrative um, health professionals and anyone? You know, so that's that's the simple thing that there is no holistic care anymore. You know, I'm interested in AF. That's all I'm interested in. So if your problem is to do with AF, I'm interested. If it's not, don't waste my time. That's the kind of mentality at the moment. And the level of training has become this kind of very guideline, protocolized uh, training. So there's no patient-centered medicine anymore. And that's what you need. And we should be uh, collaborating and we should be learning from other specialties like, uh, you know, naturopaths or whatever for the benefit of the patient. And we should be open to, to ideas so that we can innovate, so that we can do something new, uh, which allows us to get to, you know, where mainstream medicine will get several years down the line. There was this big vogue, let's just do ablations on everyone. Now people are beginning to realize that actually lifestyle matters more. You know, tell these people to lose weight. There was a study in um, Australia called the Legacy Trial, where they took a bunch of people with AF, and they told them to lose weight. And those people who lost 10% of their body weight got so much less AF. Wow. And so why has it taken this long for this very simple truth to become very obvious? You know, we know about it. Why isn't there more focus on preventative medicine, lifestyle medicine? Why aren't we holding those people to account who are putting more toxins and more sugar and stuff like that in our food, which is then passed off as, oh, mainstream, it's safe, etc. But I'm sure that that is contributing adversely to our health. So I've become very, very aware of the fact that we should be empowering people to say, take control, you know, because to me, you are a condition, but to you, you are so much more. And therefore, you need to, we need to be educating you. And more importantly, we shouldn't be chastising you for trying to work out things on your own. That is so important. Hi guys, hope you're enjoying this podcast with Dr. Gupta. If you are struggling for motivation and consistency and really want to improve your fitness levels, my details are in the description below. Feel free to reach out to me for a free 15 minute consultation and we'll take things from there. Enjoy the rest of the podcast. So just in terms of, you know, anxiety. Are you familiar with the Wim Hof method? Uh, yes, I've, I've certainly had, um, I know about it, and I've certainly had some patients talk to me about it. Um, in respect with AF, you know, a lot of patients, um, because again, what I do doesn't cover everything, you know, our, our medicines don't, don't, don't completely get rid of it. And a lot of people are left thinking, what can I do? What can I do to improve my symptoms? What can I do to... And they therefore go out and they look and they search the internet and they identify uh, other people in the same boat who say, oh, I tried this. So a lot of my patients feel empowered enough to go and do their own research. And many of them have come back and said, oh, you know, I tried this. And many of them have specifically referred to the Wim Hof method and they say, well, I've been doing this and it's improved my quality of life. And whenever I hear that, I say, great, you know, if it's improved your quality of life and you've gotten to it through your own research, keep going. 
because this was more than I could have given you. So, yeah, I'm all for it. I'm all for people trying stuff out. No one has come back to me and said, I tried this and I've come to home. But, you know, there are people who've said, I've tried it, it hasn't made a huge difference. But there are lots of others who've said, actually, that does make a difference. So if it's something you can do, if it's something doesn't co that doesn't cost you thousands and thousands of pounds, and if it's something that's generally safe, then I don't see a problem with trying it. Okay, so just um, one question that I wanted to ask you was, um, it was about an incident that happened a few months ago with a professional footballer, um, similar profile to me. Um, unfortunately, he had a cardiac arrest on a football pitch and I'd read that he, uh, the cause of it was AF. Um, and obviously at the time I had people contacting me and, and even myself, like I, I it was really worried about something similar happening to me. Um, you know, do you think that was the likely cause? If it was a cardiac arrest, I would be very, very wary of just putting that down to AF. You know, mm. in general, we have, uh, I have thousands and thousands of patients that I've seen in my career with AF. That doesn't happen, you know. Uh, AF makes you feel unwell. Sometimes it can make you feel very unwell. Mm. But in general, I haven't come across people having a cardiac arrest due to AF. Mm -hmm. What is more likely in this person is that they have some kind of cardiomyopathic process going on. So they have abnormal heart muscle for whatever reason. Okay. Or another cause of... So the, the, the two main things in, from, from a... From a heart perspective, why do people suddenly get cardiac arrest? By far and away, the commonest thing is a heart attack. You know, one of the heart arteries blocks off, the heart goes without blood, and then that uh, suffocating heart goes into an abnormal heart rhythm, and that then results in death. So, but that's usually seen in patients above the age of 40, uh, you know, older people. So if someone says to me, a 60-year-old man dropped down dead, What's the cause? By far and away, I would say it's probably a heart attack. That is the first manifestation is the cardiac arrest. They haven't had time to complain of pain. Everything has happened and they've had a cardiac arrest. The other thing that happens is that younger people may inherit abnormal heart muscle. And that abnormal heart muscle be, may be sitting there and just doing the thing that it's meant to do. But one day that abnormal, abnormal heart muscle starts malfunctioning and can go into a heart rhythm disturbance. So the abnormal heart muscle is described as cardiomyopathy. Cardio, myo meaning muscle, pathy meaning disease of the muscle. Now the problem is that the question is, okay, how do you identify that before the cardiac arrest, right? Because that's what you want to do. You want, to, how do you identify that before? Well, you could potentially put people through a screening program where you could do an ECG and you could do a heart scan and look at their heart and say, okay. But again, the problem with that is that is just a visual uh, assessment of the heart. You know, you don't, you don't know what's going on in the heart. It's just, we know what we know, right? So because we know what we know, we go down that and we don't keep our eyes open to the fact that you could have abnormal heart muscle without it looking abnormal with then malfunctions. But then at this point in time, we don't have any technology which will tell us beyond that kind of just visual picture that, oh, it looks okay. It doesn't look abnormally thickened. It doesn't look abnormally. But I think that there is a huge number of people who have sudden deaths who probably have abnormal heart muscle, which hasn't been picked up either because they haven't been screened, or even if they had been screened, wouldn't have looked abnormal, but the fact that something bad happened tells you that there was something abnormal about it. When you have a cardiac arrest, then it's not uncommon when people are trying to resuscitate you, and in particular when they try and shock your heart out of that cardiac arrest, that the heart can go into AF. So it's not uncommon to yeah. see a bit of AF. So I don't think the AF is likely to be the cause of this. I think the AF is just something that they've picked up as a consequence of all that irritability that was going on. And, you know, from ventricular fibrillation, it is quite understandable that you're tr dealing with a fibrillating ventricle and an atria, and now you're left with a bit of atrial fibrillation. So okay. I'd be very wary. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I would strongly yeah. suggest... The, the, and I'm sure they will have done that, that that footballer be screened very, very carefully. Yeah. And in some ways, if they don't find anything, if they don't find a cause, then that doesn't mean that there isn't a cause. The very fact that this has happened 
worries you that it could happen again. And in that patient, often they would decide to put in a defibrillator because they would say, well, we don't know what else to do, but we know this can happen again. So let's just put a safeguard in, so an implantable yeah. defibrillator. Yeah, well, I wish him a um, speedy recovery and yeah. hopefully he gets uh, back playing again one day. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, there are players who have started playing with defibrillators. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's right. There. Christian yeah. Eriksen. Christian Eriksen, yeah. Um, it's quite interesting, actually, because there's other... Um, professional footballers that have had ablations as well like yeah. Sergio Aguero has had one uh, Michael Carrick played for Manchester United he's had one as well so yeah, you know. yeah. absolutely I mean I think I think um, particularly in someone like your case I can't see any reason why you can't just go back to yeah no so I've, I've been playing um, you know I think it's just that whole anxiety sometimes it's that worrying about if something's going to happen or am yeah. I going to go into AF yeah. again you know, but I've started to overcome sort of that phase now and I've kind of reached a, a new part of my life where I've kind of learned to deal with the anxiety when it's there, but yeah. also just constantly trying to um, improve the, the quality of, of, of my life and constantly working on it. And one of the big things now to kind of give me even more accountability is to kind of help other people. And like, you know, for me... Th th I kind of see it as like I'm, I'm helping people to improve their lifestyles. And it gives me a big level of satisfaction. And, you know, you're, you're helping improve, you're saving people's lives, you know. So is, do you have the same like, level of satisfaction with your clients when you're, when you're working with them? Yeah, I mean, I, th I mean, there, uh, you know, hand on heart, do I really save anyone's lives? I don't know, <laughs> you know, um, but uh, but this the, this idea of making people feel supported mm. that is very satisfying. The idea that when you are lonely and scared, you can say you can you have the pr that privilege. It is a privilege to be allowed to sit beside them and say, okay, you know. I don't know how we're going to get out of this, but I'm with you. Along this journey, you're not alone. And that, I think, does more for the patient than giving them pills and things, you know, just that support. And uh, so in that sense, I very much uh, recognize the privilege yeah. of my duties. And I, I would just like to, to add to that and just kind of, you know, thank you for your videos and like for thank what you. you're doing, thank you. especially on behalf of myself, but also probably thousands of other patients that are out there that have come across your content so thank you thank you so, so thank you very much um so what i'm doing at the moment is i have you know i've opened the gym i've started to transition away from my fast-paced recruitment lifestyle i'm really trying to dive into sort of the online coaching um i've got my own app and throughout this app uh, by using this app for for any clients that i'm working with i start to really focus on improving the quality of their life and building some structure and some routine and some discipline into their week um, based around sort of fitness training, uh, dieting, uh, weight loss, improved energy levels, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, what I try to do with clients is I really work to find that, that flow state of uh, momentum where they start to build up a bit of you know excitement about mm. what they're doing and once we get them into that phase you know that is really where the magic happens you start to see people you know just completely you know making better decisions you know and if you add up all of those better decisions over you know if you compound them over years then hopefully for them it you know it does start to improve and you know it's um it's uh, probably for me like one of the most satisfying things to do. So, you know, I'm hoping that with this content today that, you know, with all of the education about my my circumstances and, and everything else that, you know, people can, can kind of pick up on and learn from, from what we've said. So, you know, do you have any advice for any, you know, heart patients or people with AFib or people who don't have AFib, you know, do you have any advice for them um, around exercise? Yeah, I think, uh, thank you. And I think, I think what you're doing is incredible because uh, the first thing is you are coming from a very authentic place. 
you know, this I, it's very obvious when I talk to you that this is something that has really affected your life, and and in some ways you've you're using this in the most positive way, which is service to your community, uh, and so I dearly wish in my own heart that this is a success. Uh, Thank you. Because. Uh, because we need people like that. We need people who come from a place of darkness and try and illuminate someone else's life rather than someone who says, okay, uh, you know, this is a potential money-making opportunity. That, that, you know, there's no shortage of people like that. Uh, but when you've gone through that trauma yourself, I think, uh, I think that will resonate with a lot of people and it just gives a different kind of empathy um so so you. you know congratulations and i wish you well in terms of uh, your question about exercise you know there, there's so much about exercise which is in some ways the, exercise is the perfect medicine mm. because it not only makes you healthy physically but a lot of people neglect to mention that it's exercise is a meditation you know the meditative effects of exercise are often not uh, highlighted. A lot of people who come to see me will say, well, I'm up and down at work all day long. That is not exercise. That is, that, that is not meditation. That's just stress. <laughs> yeah. But where you are in a zone, you can put everything else out, all the extra noises, and you can mm. just focus on one thing. And particularly with someone who can motivate you and who can give you goals, etc. I think that's incredibly good, important. From a heart perspective, one of the most important things to say is that actually... You know, as we get older, the majority of us, one, what is going to happen is our arteries are going to harden. We're going to get narrowings of our arteries. And the big risk is that we will eventually, many of us will have heart attacks, etc. as we get older. This is the epidemic cardiologically. One of the really interesting things is that when you develop these heart artery narrowings over a period of time, if you're exercising and if you're increasing uh, the demand on the heart over a period of time, then the body, the heart will often generate its own blood vessels to try and get blood to the heart. So it's called collateralization. So when we exercise, we encourage collateralization and particularly in people who already have heart disease. And therefore, if a vessel blocks off, the damage isn't as great because you've already formed these little narrow things. Uh, and so in that sense, that is another real benefit of exercise. The third thing is exercise is often the first time that people will get a warning uh, that something is going on. And those people who get a warning are indeed lucky because the real problem is when you don't get a warning beforehand, one minute you're fine, next thing you're out. You know, so exercise will often give people a warning, and that's really good. And perhaps for me, the most important thing I think is that you will have noticed that when people get older, they get breathless. You know, they get breathless, and and you check their lungs out, and their lungs are okay, and you check their heart out, and they're but they're still breathless. And one of the reasons is that because of the muscle tone falling as you get older, and uh, and the inefficiency of the muscles because they're not conditioned. So that again, because frailty, old age was going to hit all of us, and therefore getting in a routine of exercise, keeping your muscle tone up, doing that is going to be exceptionally good, and will reduce the effects of frailty, which is going to be the big problem even if your heart doesn't affect you. You know, frailty is the thing that will dictate your quality of life later on. Brilliant. So again, I, I truly believe that exercise is something that should be encouraged for everyone. I do think that it's important that exercise should be a meditation and not a stress. So where people are saying, okay, I'm going to run 20 ultra marathons <laughs> in 20 days, I think that's inherently stressful. And I think you can push it too far yeah. where it actually becomes a stressor and can be harmful. But, small wins. Yeah, small wins, regular, um, doing a little bit, just keeping yourself conditioned and using it for the real benefits of meditation, uh, putting the noises uh, away uh, is incredibly important, I think. Brilliant. Thank you. Some amazing <laughs> advice there. You heard it yourself, yeah. guys. Um, so, look, thank you so much for um, for today and for, for, for all of the advice that you've given and all of the information. Um, it's kind of helped me relive 
some of the you know some of the moments and you know just talking about the ablation it reminds me you know of some really sort of challenging times but I was able to learn a lot then and still you know continuing to do so uh, so thank you very much and the last question I have is, you know, now that you kind of know my whole situation, is there sort of any <laughs> any advice or anything you'd like yeah. to leave uh, for me? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I, as, as part of my role, I have to meet a lot of people who have gone through something like you have. Mm. And, and one thing I would say is that when you have something like this, this is a life-changing experience. And how you go from here is dependent on your perspective. You can either let an event like this put you into a mental prison, or you could let it free you from one. And that's what you're doing. You know, mm. this, this, you're, you're using this experience to become more human, to enjoy the moment, uh, to be more empathic, and to appreciate the fact that things can break. I can be talking here, something bad could happen to me today. But the question is, how can I use my experiences to have a better life and, and to serve my community? And you're doing that. So as long as people do that, it just those people who go through a heart attack often come back and say, I've never felt better after my heart attack. You know, it changed my perspective. It changed, it made me, it made me realize what was important in life. And that is the goal really for everyone. Absolutely, you know, yeah. you, uh, we're all on that journey to try and identify <laughs> at some point what is important in life. Yeah. So for some people, you know, like yourself, it's come early and I'm really excited to see yeah. what you will do. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, look, thank you so much. Thank you. I really you appreciate so you coming down. Not at all. Thank um, you. I, enjoy, and, I appreciate you coming up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'll be able to sort of all of Dr. Sanjay Gupta's details will be um, in the links and details below.